that allow enough time for everybody to find their spots? We <laughs> <laughs> missed the door. I know. <laughs> I, we're still we're still learning our, our way around here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see all of you. It is great to be here today. The lieutenant governor and I are very excited to be here today to announce our first budget proposal. Uh, we're standing here with our team. It is very intentional because nothing gets done without our team. And uh, that is the way it has been in the early days of this administration. It is the way it will be uh, going forward. And so I just want to take a moment to, to note uh, some really important uh, folks who are here standing alongside the LG and me. First, Secretary Gorkowitz, who you will hear from in just a little bit. Uh, joining him, we have our uh, Transportation Secretary, Gina Pandaka, Economic Development Secretary, Yvonne Howe, our first in the nation cabinet level uh, climate chief, Melissa Hoffer, Labor and Workforce Development Secretary, Lauren Jones, Public Safety and Security Secretary, Terrence Reedy, Technology Services and Security Secretary, Jason Snyder, Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary, Rebecca Tepper, Education Secretary, Patrick Tutwiler, Health and Human Services Secretary, Kate Walsh, and Veteran Service uh, Secretary John Santiago, both freshly sworn in today. Uh, we want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, members, though, of Secretary Gorkowitz's team, um, who have worked incredibly hard. The team out of ANF, Administration and Finance, who have put their all into making our vision for Massachusetts a reality. And so, uh, at the risk of embarrassing them, I just want to acknowledge under Secretary Catherine Hornby, Budget Director Brian Shim, Finance Director John Caljo, Assistant Budget Directors Sarah Barisi and Rick McCulis and Connor Simeow, Chief of Staff Danielle Cerny, Director of Policy Chris Siefel, Deputy Legal Counsel Patrick Lynch, Jen Sullivan and all the analysts, managers including John Coogan, Carter DeHaven, Megan Delaney, Jackson Dayal, Erica Grunwald, Victoria Gutaitis, Madeline Killeen, Amelia Marceau, Jake Rooney, Andrew Shropshire, Eleanor Sullivan, Laura Tremonis, as well as Valerie Valiant and Neil Montague. We are grateful to our fabulous ANF team, uh, and we are grateful to all of our leadership here uh, joining us uh, up here because of, of, of the work that they do, and more importantly, what we represent, what they represent. This is a, an incredible collection of, of talented individuals who've chosen to give up their time and energy in uh, furtherance of making the state a better place to live for, for residents uh, everywhere. And so we are grateful to all of them. Uh, today, uh, and I believe it's, it's on its way up, we have, we have filed our first, uh, our first budget. There's a, there's a summary that goes with it. It's a little shorter, uh, but it, uh, it reflects an awful lot of work. Um, it's intentional, uh, I think, in the color, you'll see. Um, it's not just money, although it is about the money. Uh, it's also about important climate initiatives that we're, we're intending to address through, through this effort. And so uh, we'll hear more about all of that in, in just a little bit. But Today, we wanted to present a budget that will set Massachusetts up for success by lowering costs, growing our economy, and delivering on the promise of our people. Together, we're putting forth ambitious goals and historic, significant investments. Together, we are meeting the moment to build a strong economy, to create livable communities, and to put Massachusetts on the path towards a sustainable future. That's exactly what we're going to get done with this $55 billion proposed blueprint for the future of our state. Across Massachusetts, we know we see the potential, the talent, the assets, from Boston to Springfield, from Provincetown to North Adams, and in every city and town in between. Our state's rich history of firsts is proof of our ability to not only meet the challenges of this moment, but to embrace the opportunities that come with them. This is evident as we emerge from the darkest days of this COVID-19 pandemic. We emerge strong and on solid financial footing. As we become a beacon for reproductive freedom in a post-Roe America, 
as we turn the climate crisis into a clean energy economy, and as we prove time and time again that our greatest strength is our people. But our challenges shouldn't be ignored, and they won't be. The rising costs of basic necessities like groceries and childcare, a housing crisis affecting students, seniors, and families alike, workforce shortages that touch nearly every sector of our economy, the tolls that coastal erosion, extreme heat, and flooding are taking on our cities and towns. These challenges are what guided us in providing direct relief to our residents, to our communities, and to our workforce to help build an economy for Massachusetts to grow and succeed. Because public revenue does little good when people can't pay the rent, buy a house, heat their homes, or hire childcare. Our budget will change that and more. So let's get into the highlights. Our proposal today supports the success of students, improves our state's infrastructure, helps meet our bold climate goals, protects the health of our residents, and expands opportunity for families, neighborhoods, and businesses. These are investments that will change people's lives. They include the largest increase in K-12 education funding ever in our state's history, fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. The creation of Mass Reconnect, our free family college program for students over 25 without a degree, along with funding for early college, apprenticeships, job training, and more pathways into good jobs in our More resources are growing behavioral health crisis, expanding the number of inpatient beds, clinicians, behavioral health experts across the state, as well as grants to improve access to reproductive care. Record level funding to support our small businesses with technical assistance. Investments to improve public security, build safer communities, and prepare those incarcerated for successful reentry. Our brand new Office of Housing and Livable Communities will bring urgency and intentionality to driving up production and driving down costs. Funding for critical benefits, programs, and services for active service members, veterans, and their families will now come through a new cabinet cabinet level secretariat. An unprecedented level of resources to keep us on the cutting edge of clean energy. In doing all of this and more, we're focused on affordability, competitiveness, and equity. Now nearly seven million people call Massachusetts home. And we have so many reasons to be proud. Our education system is among the best in the world. We're the epicenter of healthcare, life sciences, research, and technology. We're leading the fight nationally against the climate crisis. And our region boasts natural beauty, historic towns, scenic back roads, and first-rate national parks. Looking ahead, it's on all of us to ensure that Massachusetts be the place for people to live, families to thrive, and businesses to grow. For us, this starts with making Massachusetts more affordable. It means relieving the very real financial burdens placed on our residents who enjoy being here and want to stay here. That's why, alongside this budget, we're also filing a $750 million tax package. It's a package of tax cuts and reforms. It will put money back in the pockets of families, parents, seniors, and those struggling with a high cost of housing. It includes a $600 child and family tax credit to help pa families pay for the basics like groceries and child care. Doubling the senior circuit breaker to help tens of thousands of low-income seniors stay in their homes. And long overdue relief for nearly 900,000 renters. These are just a few things that will make a real difference in people's lives. Affordability is the key to improving quality of life for our residents and the economic growth for our state. That's especially true when it comes to public education and transportation. And for the first time, our budget, this budget, is now putting forward a proposal to utilize a billion dollars in new spending uh, from the Fair Share Amendment. It makes clear a few things. 
Number one, that these funds will go to the purpose that the voters intended, to promote high quality public education and to improve our roads, bridges, and public transportation. Today, our budget proposes establishing a new education and transportation fund. This will ensure that the fair share amendment will be used exclusively for education and transportation. It will be protected, it will be transparent. We want to maximize this historic and exciting funding opportunity. On education, we'll be making investments in state-subsidized early education and care to ensure that more families have access to programming essential to the healthy growth and development of all children. These funds will increase child care slots and allow parents, including those on limited income, uh, so many women, uh, to participate in the workforce, to return to the workforce at a time when sectors throughout our economy are facing severe labor shortages. They'll put the state on a path towards universal pre-K, starting in our gateway cities. They'll expand access for high school students to quality college and career pathways. And by funding a new program we're proposing, Mass Reconnect, more financial aid, more programs will be there to help students most in need. These fair share infused investments will make public higher education more accessible and more affordable than ever before. Now on transportation, we know that transportation is another key to making Massachusetts competitive and affordable. Our state's success depends on having a system of roads, bridges, highways, and public transit that can move and connect people with jobs, family, and quality of life, and do so in a safe, reliable, and efficient manner. Using fair share funds will make historic investments to improve all modes of transportation. They'll make a difference in the lives of commuters and residents, regardless of whether they drive, take the bus, ride a bike, or walk. That includes making more accessible and ADA compliant stations. This will provide a better commuting experience for riders. Startup costs for a means-tested fare program for thousands of low-income MBTA riders. Strengthening partnerships with cities and towns to develop and implement shovel-ready transportation projects. Significant expansions in critical roadway infrastructure funding to secure more federal dollars, preserve highway bridges, and improve roadside maintenance. Increased regional transit funding to help boost our rural connectivity. And money to move along some really important transportation projects like the West East Rail, the Red Blue Connector, and the electrification of our bus fleet. All while making sure that the progress that we make supports our diversity, equity, and environmental goals. Looking to our future, as an administration, we know the effects of climate change. We know that they're one of our greatest challenges. But here's what I want everyone to understand, that while they are challenges and they are real, this is also the greatest opportunity for our state. We need to meet this moment with aggressiveness, with urgency, and with innovation. And we are capable of doing all three. We need to remind ourselves that this transition to clean energy is fundamentally about people. It's about building healthy communities, creating jobs, and protecting people's pocketbooks. That's why our budget makes historic investments in climate action. For the first time ever, 1% of the state's overall operating budget will be dedicated to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. We will triple the budget of the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center to empower our local entrepreneurs, to decarbonize our buildings, to make our, our state truly the global capital of a clean energy, innovative economy. We're stepping up our efforts to monitor our air quality, to protect our coastlines, to ensure that our water is clean and that our communities are livable for all. And in this budget, we are funding for the first time ever a brand new Office of Environmental Justice with 14 new EJ liaisons who will work across the state to make sure that communities that have been bearing the burden and the brunt of the climate crisis for far too long will help guide and lead our transition forward. And what's most important in this part of our proposal is that it shows a whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis. 
This is absolutely essential. Actions involving education, workforce, economic development, housing, health, public safety, transportation, all of this is going to be necessary for our clean energy transition. For example, there's a cross-cabinet effort to prioritize clean energy workforce development. We want to help students and workers get the education and training that they need to meet the demands of our growing clean energy sector. This is from building offshore wind, uh, building solar, installing heat pumps, inventing the next generation of clean energy technologies, manufacturing that, designing and implementing projects that will strengthen our coastal resilience. We are not going to be able to get to net zero without workers who are there to help power that clean energy transition. Similarly, Health and Human Services is focused on health and climate resiliency. Housing will be focused on energy efficiency and clean uh, efficiency. Our transportation sector will be decarbonized. What I'm saying is this all will and has to be an integrated approach. We're committed to making Massachusetts a national and world leader when it comes to combating the climate crisis and driving our clean energy economy, creating good paying jobs, sustainable jobs in clean and blue technology, coastal resiliency, and electrification, and building fundamentally cleaner, healthier, and more resilient communities. So this is our chance. And with this budget, we can build a strong and inclusive economy. We can ensure the necessary move to renewable energy is safe, is reliable, and fair to everyone. And together, we can address environmental injustices that have existed for far too long. Together, we can do this. Before I close, I just want to make one more important point. And that is that behind every line item, and we have been working through and reviewing those over the last several days and weeks, we understand and I understand there are people. Behind every number, there are people. People whose lives can be positively impacted by the decisions that we make. Families who need childcare, couples trying to buy their first home, small business owners struggling to stay afloat, college grads who can't make both rent and student loan payments, commuters who take the train in the city every day for work, dairy farmers whose lives are hinged to volatile price swings, seniors hoping they won't be forced to move out of their homes, and these are just some examples. Already this week, the Lieutenant Governor and I have had the privilege of meeting some people who will be helped by this budget. In the coming days and weeks, we will be out across the state connecting with many, many more, listening to their stories, hearing their stories, understanding what this relief could mean to them. Like the single mom of two young boys, we were just with her this morning, She's struggling to make ends meet with the rising costs of groceries, gas, and rent. Our child and family tax credit proposal will mean an additional $1,200 back to her that she can use to help her family and create a little less stress in her life. But the primary caregiver we were with the other day, she is an elderly parent who will receive, an, she will receive an additional $600 a year to help pay for his medicine and his doctor's visits. This is real stuff that will make a difference in people's lives. A student I met today who's been working on completing her community college degree for two decades, including while she was suffering from substance use disorder. She dreams of starting a small business with her daughter. And the employee who runs a great manufacturing firm, uh, Life Sciences, uh, nearby in Bedford, who has critical, good paying jobs jobs that he's ready to fill at his labs and sees our Mass Reconnect program as an opportunity to do just that. It's these people and so many more who this budget has been made for. We want to make the life of every Massachusetts resident better and more affordable. I have said for a long time now that I believe that Massachusetts has the greatest collection of human capital, intellectual capital, business, innovation, know-how, and true resilience. We sit at the intersection of bold solutions and ideas. We've never been afraid to go first and to lead, including in challenging times. 
And I think that's what we want, what we want people to know. We worked hard to craft a budget that we believe meets the moment that we're in, that helps us take on these challenges as opportunities, and will help Massachusetts lead. We look forward to continuing to work closely with our partners in the legislature on our shared goals of delivering relief for the people of this great state. Because when we work together, we can and we will meet this moment. And now I'm going to turn it over to our Lieutenant Governor, Kim Driscoll. Thank you, Governor. So excited to be here uh, with our whole team to announce our first budget that includes some really historic investments. As you can see and as you can hear from the Governor's remarks, there really is something for everyone in this budget. We worked very hard in a short amount of time, and kudos to the ANF team, and you can work here, and Secretary Gorkowitz, uh, putting together uh, you know, meaningful economic relief to offset you know, really rising cost of living that we're seeing here in Massachusetts and across, you know, frankly across the country. But keeping my municipal hat on, um, I can't stress enough how much this budget funding will benefit our communities and the people who live in our communities. Our 351 cities and towns play an important role in helping Massachusetts reach its potential, from educating our kids, keeping us safe in our neighborhoods, investing in places where we build vibrant, healthy, livable communities. That's delivered at the local government level. And that's why our budget proposes these historic investments in local aid, really a down payment on the future for our cities and towns, our schools, our kids, and fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. That's $600 million, our largest increase ever for K-12 schools in Massachusetts history. Think about that. Largest increase in some of our youngest residents. In addition to the Chapter 70 local aid uh, increases, we're also adding funding to better address the needs of our rural communities, to help strengthen our partnerships with small towns, we're really trying to be thoughtful about how we roll out resources to meet people where they are on the ground. That's a little different, and we're really proud of that effort. And as well of our, that investment and so many exciting community investments made uh, in this budget, I'll highlight a few of them. Support for our public libraries, the great equalizer in our communities, by offering e-books, supporting digital equity, providing accessible programming, regardless of physical or intellectual ability, something our libraries have leaned into, we're going to be a strong partner for that. Creating a live theater tax credit to help with payroll, production, and transportation costs of live theater productions, fostering an important aspect of our cultural landscape and support for the creative economy. That creative economy was hit hard during the pandemic. There was no ability to do business, and yet we know it's key to the vibrancy of our communities. So many people go out to eat before or after taking in a live show. They needed help, and it's included in this budget. $25 million for food insecurity, for local food economies to flourish, Better connecting our farmers, fishermen, or other local food producers to a strong, resilient food system, all aimed at Massachusetts becoming a food secure state. We can do that with this budget. We've also proposed significant investments in early ed and care. Investing in quality care for our youngest residents is going to help both the ch those children and our working families, and it remains a critical piece of our administration strategy to make Massachusetts a more affordable place to live. We know we're a high child care state. This is going to help this budget. Making Massachusetts a more affordable place to live for families. Well, the only way to do that is to tackle child care. Our budget supports subsidized child care for 55,000 eligible children in EEC licensed programs and more child care seats for low income families who have been on the state's waiting list for far too long. To support that, we're continuing the C3 stabilization grant, something uh, those of us in this building hear a lot about. That's going to prevent child care centers from closing and enable more parents to return to work, and more single moms who definitely need that service to get back into a position to help support their family. Our education priorities center around making sure every student, regardless of zip code or background, gets the best educational opportunities possible. This means closing our achievement and opportunity gaps in the K-12 education, education system. It means supporting the critical educator retention efforts and wraparound services so many of our students and families rely on. It means funding universal mental health trainings and improving that pipeline of early education in K-12 educators with an emphasis on diversity so each child can see themselves when they walk into their classrooms in the morning. 
We know that experiential learning is also critical for providing students that real-world, hands-on experience they need to thrive in the, young, in the workforce. So many of our young people are telling us they want to know that what they're learning today when they walk in their high school or their middle school, that it's connected to the career opportunities they may want to pursue later in life. This budget's going to help do that by proposing nearly $47 million for early college and innovation pathways, a proven concept that's working in a number of communities, a $14.4 million expansion over fiscal year 23's budget. This will expand opportunities for high school students to explore college and career pathways before graduating. In high school, you can earn up to 24 credits. That's a really important uh, tool for, for families and for students. And we're going to enroll 10,000 students in coursework across industries, including IT, engineering, healthcare, life sciences, and advanced manufacturing. All key sectors right here in Massachusetts that we know if you're trained, there is a job opportunity for you. We're also proposing a historic funding increase of $370 million over fiscal year 23's budget to expand college affordability, to support our higher ed campuses, and to provide extensive behavioral health care services to students in need. Now, I stand here today as a public higher ed grad. Go Vikings. <laughs> um, at that time, you could hustle all summer and pay your tuition. That's just no longer the case. This budget is going to go a long way towards ensuring that our students are going to have a more affordable option and then have the supportive services around them to attend our higher ed institutions. And why is that important? Look, our public higher ed grads, there are future teachers and nurses and business owners and accountants and entrepreneurs. The majority of the folks graduating from our public higher ed institutions, they stay right here in the Commonwealth. So by investing in our public universities, we're investing in our future leaders. These are all critical steps on the path toward helping achieve more affordable and accessible education pipelines for every student and every family in this commonwealth. That's something we can do with this budget. When it comes to housing, there's no greater priority in this administration and no greater crisis in our state. In every community we're in, we hear about housing. Today, along with our budget, we filed Article 87 legislation to establish an executive office of housing and livable communities that will have a new secretariat focused on housing. Guess we're going to need to make a little bit more room on this stage, or we're going to have to get a bigger stage. Uh, the new secretary will help us focus on the urgent need to build more places to live that are affordable, that are closer to public transit, and that give residents access to jobs and medical care and other needed services. It will prioritize housing as a key driver of economic growth and increase both our focus and resources on housing production and pres preservation, with equity being a major driver of that work. Housing is not only key to the social determinants of health, but of the educational outcomes of individuals who live and have access to safe and accessible housing, of the economic opportunities they'll be able to pursue. Frankly, just basic, decent quality of life. Our administration knows that. We know we need to take on housing affordability by preserving existing supply, by ramping up production, by tackling homelessness, and by harnessing housing as a tool for economic mobility. One example of that effort in this budget is for our gateway cities, proposing an increase in the annual cap of the Housing Development Incentive Tax Program from $10 million to $50 million in the first year, and then $30 million per year moving forward. It will triple on a regular basis, but to keep up with that backlog, we're going from $10 million to $50 million. We know there are projects that are in the ready, in that pipeline, can start, but they need these tax credits to close the gap of rising inflation and increased housing costs moving forward. We're going to unlock more market rate and community housing in our gateway cities with this tool. It's one of the biggest things I hear from, from my colleagues, and I know it's an effort that uh, will, will be utilized on a, as soon as it's available. We're going to be working closely with all of our local leaders and community members to figure out ways that we can overcome the current barriers to housing and to produce more of it and better understand what resources are needed at the local level by our cities and, and towns to increase that supply of housing and then try and do everything we can to deliver it. We are an ecosystem. If one community is saying no to housing, it has impacts across our region. So we're going to have to work on this together. We all rely on people who need to be housed in our commonwealth. We want to stand up for those voices and put ourselves in a position to partner in this effort. And in closing, when, when Governor-elect Healy and Governor-elect, <laughs> <laughs> that's an oldie. Um, when Governor Healy and I say we're teammates, we, we really mean it. I feel fortunate to be her partner as we do this work. I think all of us do. 
This, we think we have an incredible team of secretaries, and together we're working on some of the most pressing issues facing our Commonwealth. And frankly, I think we're grateful to be in this position to help, to lead and to work together as a team on these challenges. It's not lost on us that this incredible honor comes with it of a deep responsibility. And with the filing of today's budget, I believe this is an incredible start to that work. We look forward to the conversations our head, ahead with our legislative leaders and uh, are really grateful to be in a position to try and tackle these challenges in a meaningful way. Thanks to the whole team for all the work they've done to get us to this point, and uh, we're looking for forward to discussions to move forward. Thank you, LG. Secretary? First, I want to thank the governor, uh, Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, uh, and the entire team of the governor's office. Uh, they've been hands-on in crafting this budget and have been a tremendous partner in helping me and my team get this new administration to its first big milestone. I also want to thank my colleagues in the cabinet and their staffs. They have been working with us every step of the way, and I really appreciate how quickly we've become fast friends. Thank you. I especially want to thank my team at ANF, especially our budget team, led by Assistant Secretary uh, for Budget, Brian Chin, who has really leaned in to make this all possible, and I thank you all so very much. Both the Lieutenant Governor uh, and Governor have already introduced many of the uh, historic investments uh, we are proposing in this budget, so I'd like to focus a little bit more on the architecture and the mechanics uh, while highlighting some additional funding that I think you should all be aware of. We are addressing our challenges um, here in the Commonwealth uh, head-on do targeted investments that drive affordability, equity, and competitiveness. We are doing so with a few guiding principles in mind. Throughout the FY24 budget plan, the administration has relied on four guiding principles to ensure our resources are strategically deployed. One, investing in long-term success by keeping long-term <coughs> impacts and, uh, and system transformation in mind. Maximizing available investments by considering our complete toolbox of funding sources and vehicles, including the budget, capital plan, supplemental budgets, Article 87 of the organization. For striving for transparency through easy to understand budget documents for public, including budget briefs, uh, and, uh, that describe our investments in detail and other supplemental materials uh, that help with the budgeting context. To that end, we are filing the following three pieces of legislation today that the governor, and the governor mentioned, uh, the fiscal year 24 budget, uh, a tax relief package, which we spent uh, this past week rolling out and talking to many of you about, and the Article 87 reorganization elevating our Department of Housing and Development to a Housing Secretariat. Also in the coming days, we'll be filing a supplemental budget making key one-time investments, providing traditional funding for COVID area programs, um, and funding more uh, core programs that will have run updates prior to the end of the fiscal year. The FY24 budget invests $55.5 billion, a 4.1% increase over fiscal year 23 and represents a balanced, fiscally responsible spending plan for the next fiscal year. The budget includes $3.3 billion in new revenue spending, uh, spending and investments made possible by a reduction of nearly $1.1 billion of one-time transfers that were made in fiscal year 23. The spending is supported by $2.2 billion in new revenues available uh, for fiscal year 24, including $500 million in new taxes based on the consensus revenue agreement, after accounting for the transfers uh, our budget and the $742 million tax reform proposal. $700 million in growth in non-tax revenue and other sources, and the additional $1 billion of fair share revenue offsetting spending on these uh, key investments. The budget includes $1 billion worth of investments in the Education and Transportation Fund using fair share revenue. These investments include $510 million in education, $100 million to help stabilize the early education and care system, $25 million for increased child care slots for income eligible families, $15 million investment uh, that will put Commonwealth on a path for universal pre-K starting in gateway cities, totaling $30 million, $10 million uh, to expand access for high school students to high quality college and career pathways, $360 million more in affordable public higher education through Mass Reconnect, financial aid expansion, and division of destabilizers. Transportation uh, is funded at $490 million, uh, roughly 50% of the fair share spending. $100 million to strengthen state municipal partnerships to develop, implement critical transportation uh, projects. $164 million in the preservation of critical highway bridge, in, uh, bridge infrastructure. $186 million to improve 
uh, more accessibility and uh, projects at the MBTA station, and $5 million uh, from each tested MBTA pairs, and innovative service pilots uh, to increase rural and um, uh, connectivity for RTAs. Our House 1 recommendation also establishes appropriate safeguards and mechanisms to ensure accurate tracking and protections from volatile revenue shifts, including establishing the Education Transportation Fund, a separate fund with a fair share of revenues restricted only for spending on education and transportation. The fund will not revert to the general fund, and at the end of the year, a fiscal year, uh, will not be part of consolidated net surplus. Establishing a required minimum fund balance only to be used in the event of significant revenue declines and to, to preserve programs and the face services. The required balance uh, will set uh, a one third uh, annual recurring, uh, be set at one third of the annual recurring spending. Limiting the annual recurring spending to protect programs from volatile revenues during economic downturns will limit the growth uh, of annual spending uh, using the 10 year rolling average, meaning that we will cap spending based on the 10 year rolling average to ensure that whatever programs and services are funded from the fair share revenues will be, um, will be preserved and uh, be available for the year over year. Revenues um, over the annual cap uh, will be available uh, for the same purposes, education and transportation, um, and will be spent on one-time uh, uh, investments. Uh, for example, you can use it for pay bill capital, pilot programs, startup grants, uh, various one-time investments. To ensure transparency, DOR and the controller will certify revenues quarterly and at the end of the year uh, publish annual spending and, and revenue reports. This long-term sustainable planning uh, is a key feature of the FY24 budget recommendation and the administration's philosophy on maximizing the impact of available resources. You've heard of many of the other investments made uh, in the 24 budget from the governor uh, and the Senate governor, uh, and we'll continue to, continue to get more uh, details about the exciting investments we're about to make in the coming days. Uh, you should all have access to a number of materials our team has produced to help make this budget as transparent and open as possible. Our budget website, complete with our executive summaries and line item detail, new budget briefs uh, that describe investments in detail. Um, should you have any questions, the ANF team stands ready to provide you with additional information on historic investments in making across the Commonwealth. So I appreciate you uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Um, at this time, we're happy to take questions and again, grateful to, to our team uh, and the secretaries who can feel free to. Today, um, we've already filed some things, so we don't look at, at one particular thing um, on its own. We look at the entire package, and you know, when it comes to um, the budget itself, uh, we made a point of fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. We have made historic, larger than ever, investments through the budget in um, K through 12 education. There's a lot there. In addition, we have this other revenue source now of the fair share amendment. And I think what we heard loud and clear is that the voters and folks out there want to make sure that that money is set aside, is to be used exclusively for education and transportation, that there would be transparency and accountability about that. That revenue does afford us to make additional investments in K-12 education, as well as really important investments that we need to make in early education, in child care, as well as public higher ed education. So you know, that's, that's how we saw it. I don't know, Mr. Secretary, if there's anything further. 
No, I think um, I think you, you uh, I think you said it well. Um, and, you know, I would just point out that when you look at uh, the significant increases in uh, in education uh, that are paid for in the general fund, uh, we felt that investments in EEC and higher ed were appropriate for fair share given the fact that they were new um, and didn't consider expansion. Um, the Student Opportunity Act, five hundred eighty-five million dollars that we're investing, is you know um, it's, it's been phased in over over seven years, and so there's been a pattern of funding those increases through general fund dollars, and I think one could you know see that um, trying to ship that over and fund those increases to fair share could be potentially uh, seen as supplanting, um, and so we we, we try to uh, preserve uh, those K B twelve programs that have been historically funded on the general fund in the general fund, preserving the um, uh, money and fair share for new uh, expansion and new investments, which is why the $10 million on early college and pathways is in the fair share. That's a program that has ramped up substantially this year. It's relatively uh, new in terms of its funding. It certainly has been around for uh, a couple of years, but only recently has it been ramped up, and so it's considered, from our perspective, to be a bit new and, and expansive, and that's why we included it there. There hasn't been such investments uh, in EDC and uh, um, in higher ed, and, and so we felt uh, it was important to get their uh, investments uh, made uh, in the fair share funding was an opportunity to do so. Uh, thank you. And I, you know, look, um, we sort of styled the theme of this budget, meeting the moment. And we know the moment presents challenges, the moment presents opportunities. You know, among Massachusetts' other firsts, we're home to the first public school in the country, also the first public library, which is also why we wanted to make sure our libraries get the funding that they needed. But you know, this is something that the, the LG and I take really, really seriously, uh, K through 12 education, public education, and also we recognize that there are other needs out there. Child care costs were among the highest in the nation, and it's really holding too many people, too many families back. Uh, we need to, to increase accessibility to child care and early ed slots. We also need to seize the moment when it comes to real workforce challenges afflicting nearly every sector of, of the labor force out there. And one of the ways we do that is by making those investments in public higher ed. To the LG's point, students who matriculate at public higher ed institutions here are likely to stay here in Massachusetts, grow families, grow businesses, grow opportunities in Massachusetts. So let's meet them where they are, including through support, through programming like Mass Reconnect, which we think is a really terrific program that will bring people who have some credentials towards college, but because they couldn't afford uh, rent, they, they're working two jobs, they're raising kids, um, maybe even uh, their car broke down and they needed to spend the money on that rather than tuition or fees. They had to, they had to leave school. This program brings these adults back into workforce training opportunities and you know, represents, I think, the kind of intentionality that we need when it comes to addressing education uh, Across the board. Oh, Governor, on the, on, on the supplemental side, the legislature is considering $130 million in additional funding for the, the COVID area expansion of the SNAP benefits that run out tomorrow. Um, and you're proposing a, sort of 40% of that to um, help people for another three months. Talk about that and can you expend it can you extend it beyond three months? Because people are saying with the rise of inflation. Just well, I think that we really appreciate that, and and certainly um, our former acting secretary of health and human services, Mary Beckman, and the team got to work on that early on, identifying where there was going to be an expiration of certain federal programs and benefits that families here are depending on, and it's why we a few weeks ago put forward that that sub budget to address that. I think you can expect that in the coming weeks we'll probably put forward another sub-budget to address uh, you know, further needs that, that families may be facing with respect to expiration of, of particular programs. But we're very sensitive to, to the cliff that some were facing. That's exactly why we sought to address that in our sub. And Do you anticipate it will pass and then you, you think you could extend it beyond three months? I, I certainly hope it will pass and we've had productive conversations with the legislature. I think that you know all of us who serve, whether you're wearing the hats that we wear, or whether you're elected to serve and represent your, your city, your town, or your district, understand the needs and challenges facing residents out there, and, and those are certainly among them. More broadly about, there are a lot of offerings in this budget, in this budget based from federal funding to the pandemic. Can you speak more broadly about how you guys are trying to address the end of that funding in this budget? Well, 
Well, so I think it, it goes a little bit to the point I was trying to make earlier that we do recognize that funding is running out from the federal government with respect to certain benefits programs um, that so many families have been relying on. And so we tried to approach it thoughtfully um, and tried to, to create uh, scenarios where, where people could have a more graduated glide path, so to speak, um, as, that, as that funding was expiring. And that's why we made the decision to file the SUP budget. Um, and that's why you may see us be filing additional um, measures going forward. Again, I welcome the comments of my colleagues. No, I think, you, I think you summarized it well. I think the SUP budget will um, look at some of those COVID era programs and you know, certainly recognize that uh, there is a need to uh, have a gradual uh, ramp down of some of those one time funding. Uh, it is a reality that the FY23 budget has a lot of spending in it that is uh, built up uh, because of some of the availability of those uh, one time dollars. Um, and as we draft, uh, crafted our 24 budget, we really wanted to uh, develop a budget that represented the base resources that we could have going forward. Um, and using some of our one-time resources to try to, um, as we have in, 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 in certain instances, uh, try to ramp down some of those uh, programs, recognizing that people need some time and programs need some time to adjust to what um, the, the future holds for them. You um, highlighted a lot of the fair share amendment investments. How big of a deal is that for the community? Because I know that's something that the community makes when we're talking about a $55 billion it means a lot to, you know, you, you think about it, sure, it's a big number, right? $55 billion. But we think about it in terms of actual dollars flowing to families, flowing to residents, and the difference that it makes in somebody's life. The difference between being able to make rent, make a student loan payment, you know, afford childcare, afford education, that's what it's about. Pay the grocery bill. Um, and so that's that's how we think of it. And, you know, I, I think that our, our budget proposal is intended to do the things we talked about. Deal with the affordability issue that's real here. Deal with our competitiveness and situating us to be as competitive as we can be as a state. And centering equity across the board. Equity, an equity lens, we've said, this administration is gonna apply an equity lens across everything that we do as we make these considerations. And, you know, um, I think this, this budget represents uh, the potential and the value proposition for this state, and we're going to get there only by working together. Um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased with, with what we were able to come up with and, and grateful to the team. And LG, do you want to add anything more on that? Um, other than um, I think that uh, when you think about a billion dollars in the context of the $55 billion budget, it may sound like it's not as substantial as it really is. When you put a billion dollars towards where we end in transportation needs on top of what we're already spending, it's pretty significant. And so I think we're you know, grateful to be in a position to be able to make investments that are not only going to help now, but will also lead towards longer term economic prosperity. You can have childcare for working families, if you can support public higher ed access. If you can make it easier for people to get to work, that's not only a quality of life impact now, but you're leading towards some longer term economic prosperity. So that's what a billion dollars can do. So, so can you can ask about the funding for Mass Health. Um, I want to ask about the funding for Mass Health. Um, the budget kind of factors in about 300,000 people to make this work kind of um, funding for Mass Health. How did you guys get to that number? Um, what did you think about the 300,000 people getting off the Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I welcome Secretary Gorkowitz with, with more details on that. But look, um, we know what we're facing right now this spring with redetermination. We know the work that we need to do, and I know that Secretary Walsh and the team is, is very focused on that, working with other secretaries, by the way, so that we have as smooth a transition as possible as we move through redetermination. And so I think those numbers reflect our best uh, educated estimates of what is, what is necessary and, and appropriate to, to meet this moment and the needs of folks who have been um, accessing mass health. I, I think the governor actually said it exactly right. Um, I don't think I have anything to add to it. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is not, you know, uh, this is not sort of anybody who's uh, eligible for the, the program uh, we're trying to maintain in the program. Um, the numbers are projections. They're our best guess at this time. But um, the, the administration's been working very closely with Mass Health on uh, the process for the redetermination. And, um, uh, the numbers reflect that reality. Governor, there seems to be some pretty significant backlash.
Can you comment on your comments about equity and how your budget builds upon the notion of regional equity and also your administration plan for the funding for East Coast Rail? Oh, we can talk a lot about this. I'll say some things, and the LG will definitely support an ad because I'll forget a number of things. But equity, um, yeah, for the first time ever, we're going to have an office of environmental justice. We're going to have 14 people who are working across the Commonwealth focused on issues of environmental injustice in their community and how we can address it and move forward. We're going to have funding for rural economies, places that for too long have felt and have been left behind. This does get to transportation and West East Rail. I said that for you. East West Rail. <laughs> West East Rail. Um, but <laughs> all of these levels. And regional transit authorities, too. Right? Because the modes of transportation vary across this state. And you know, these are just some of the ways we think about equity. We think about child care. You know? um, the number of people who are working in child care, disproportionately women, disproportionately people of color, how do we support them? Well, we take a little bit of that fair share of money and we create funding for more slots, which, by the way, is also going to help families disproportionately lower income, disproportionately of color, access needed child care. Mass Reconnect. You know, 1.8 million residents in the state are eligible for that program, if you can believe it. 700,000 of those already have a little bit of, of schooling towards a degree, towards a credential. And we just got to get them back on that path. And you can imagine, disproportionately lower income, immigrant, first in their, in their family to go to college. Um, these are the ways we think about equity. Reproductive care. This is 25 million in this budget? 26, 26 even more. Because we care about equity. Today's the first day of Women's History Month. You better under, believe that this administration was going to make sure that we're doing everything we can to address issues of gender inequities that persist, including making sure that women have access to the care that they need. And I think across the board, you know, um, you're going to see a lens. All the secretaries know this. It's in part why they signed up to do this, because we believe we have an opportunity to do things differently. And I think significantly it starts with what we say in our budget and what we stand behind and what we prioritize and who that's meant to help, right? We know, and I understand, no, I'm new. This is just the start of that conversation, and we look forward to the dialogue that we'll have with our legislative colleagues. But that's that's how we see this. Maybe just on the regional equity piece, because I think that's important. We do have funding for East West Rail built in, but more importantly, there's been a lot of groundwork from our rural communities agenda. Representative Blay, Senator Comerford, former Senator Hines, we've really embraced making sure as we think about the programs and policies that operate that we're not just looking at them through that same lens. So you'll see additional funding for regional transportation, something that disproportionately impacts um, school districts in the western part of the state. Um, you'll see uh, things like the live uh, theater tax credit. That originally, I think they just included sort of a, a, a more of a Boston focus that's now available for uh, a larger geography. Um, we've tapped into the RTAs to make sure we're allowing for some innovation, just how we typically would do per capita funding. Does it work for so many of our smaller districts? And, and, and areas that the geography and the neighborhoods look different and the places people need to go are different. And that's just the beginning of it. I think we really want to embrace a strong rural communities agenda that's not just Western Mass. There are rural communities in the Cape as well with a recognition that one size does not fit all. So we have dollars, we have opportunities to work in closer partnership with many of these smaller towns to make sure they're engaging in some of the activities that can help them. Even technical assistance, the community compacts, we've enhanced that funding. A lot of that is geared towards um, thinking beyond just Greater Boston. The age step, the age step funding, which, as we said, we're increasing from 10 million to 50 million, that is going to help a tremendous amount of housing growth in gateway cities, particularly the gateway cities outside of Greater Boston, where you cannot make the cost of the properties, the cost of new housing, pencil out. They really need these age step tax credits to be able to develop market rate housing in their downtowns and to create community housing within those spaces as well. That's going to be significant increases for. Uh, places like Holyoke and Pittsfield that have the ability to build housing but don't necessarily have the private sector incentivized to do that because it just doesn't pencil out. So it's it's exciting times from my mind for rural communities. I, we're very personally invested in making sure 
that we're thinking about resource allocation in a way that benefits the entire Commonwealth. Tourism, well, we've got enhanced funding for, funding for tourism. There's a large part of the Western economy um, that we think can benefit from enhanced tourism funding. If you've been to Springfield, the amazing museum campuses, and not just the basketball hall of fame, although we are fans of that, um, you know, there's the there's ability to help the Western mass economy in a greater way in some of these areas around tourism and hospitality. Those are just some examples, but we're, we're pretty bullish on it. Sorry, can you speak a little bit about your approach to MBTA hiring? I think in your inaugural address you said we're going to fund hiring of thousand workers. Now it's fund new hiring and training supports for thousand workers. What's the shift there? Well, the shift is there was one time, there's one time a lot of money uh, towards the hiring already of, of the thousand workers. So, you know, the good news is that is already part of, of what DOT has has within its disposal. We are focused on new money, though, that will go more on the recruitment side. I mean, this is just so important. A reason that the LG and I were out at the garage yesterday, um, we wanted to thank the workers and also highlight, showcase what they do and the careers available through our Department of Transportation. And so that is going to uh, require a particular singular focus to recruit for the T, a range of positions, and that's what the new money is going to be for. Uh, I did promise him. Uh, <laughs> real quick, uh, there seem to be some pretty quick uh, media backlash to the tax cuts. Um, Raven Massachusetts described the state tax and kept short of the gains cuts as incredibly aggressive, especially on the heels of the passage of the Fair Share Amendment. Can you speak to those people who have concerns that they're perhaps providing uh, tax cuts to rich people in the state need those people to step up? Well, absolutely. Let me, and, you know, I'd be interested to see how people feel today given, given our budget and what we spoke of in terms of some really significant in, investments in, in folks across the state. Um, a couple of things. The tax package that we put forward, remember, it doesn't stand on its own. It stands alongside other things that we filed, the budget, the sub-budget, even Article 87 focusing on driving up housing so that we can drive down costs for people. That's all part of one, one package, and I think it should be looked at through that lens. When it comes to the actual tax package, $750 million, I think more than two-thirds of that, $560 million of that almost, is specifically putting money back in the pockets of folks who are most vulnerable through our child and family tax credit, right? Through our doubling of the circuit breaker for seniors, for assistance for renters. There's a lot of really good, important, meaningful things in that. And so we encourage people to focus on the affordability that we created through that proposed package. Um, and, you know, we also putting money back in people's pockets has a stimulus effect. But the focus is on affordability, right? And more than two thirds, more than two thirds of those tax cuts are going to help those in a very progressive way. And that doesn't even take into account the $50 million on top of that of tax credits to support the HDIP program, which, as the LG just said, is going to grow housing, including market rate housing, in gateway cities. Really, really important. Where, um, so that, that, that's part of it. Um, and you know, again, we look forward to, to further discussion on this. We, we took a careful look at uh, what it was going to mean in terms of our proposals, both with respect to the estate tax and short-term capital gains. And I think as many of us know, you know, if, um, if, you own, if you're fortunate to own a home here in Massachusetts, the, the value is only appreciated. And there are so many people who've lived in homes for so long where just the equity there, the value of their homes has gone way up so that we just didn't feel like a million dollars for an estate tax uh, just doesn't cut it anymore. And, you know, we also have to address in that um, the reality that Massachusetts is an outlier compared to other states. And you guys know me. I'm a competitor. I want Massachusetts soaring. I want our families soaring. I want opportunities for folks, uh, particularly those who've been left out for far too long. And, you know, we have to address the fact that we're one in 12 states that even has an estate tax. And what we propose today um, has an ability to cover more people who we think are like uh, those I'm talking about. You know, seniors who are sitting on homes right now where values have just appreciated, and they're going to make a call right now as to what they're going to do. Um, and so we, we thought that was appropriate. But, you know, really excited about what our tax credits as a package uh, and tax relief 
affords for so many families desperately needing help right now across the state. I got your mind. I'll start such a question on the calls for physics. I'm going to honor Jillian. I am going to, I'll take you, and then I'll take you, and then we are going to go, and you can follow up with the team. How's that? Um, what's the question? Yeah, I'll create my phone call. Thank you. I don't think there's a lot of disagreement between the previous government and the legislature. I'm not sure about the 20 million. Well, a 20 million is what was set aside for the legislature. Yeah, I know. Well, a 20 million is what was set aside already, and so our view was we ought to use that. It's already been set aside for this program, uh, which is to provide free, no-cost calls to those who are incarcerated. And Formally, as Attorney General, I supported this because I understand the importance of helping build those connections um, between those who are incarcerated and, and family, particularly on the, on the outside. And the costs have come down, but we thought that $20 million using that, um, what we could do was deal with the entities within our control, specifically DOC. And so that's why we made that proposal to, to institute that program uh, starting with our DOC facilities. And we think that that's probably the right amount based on what we've seen. You know, we look at usage and, you know, this will allow people about a 1,000 minutes a month. We think it's probably about right. We'll see. Okay. Why do you now with regard to the line of connector? I think we've got to look at all of our transportation projects right now. It's something that Secretary Fiendaka is very, very focused on. Uh, the key, the key focus right now is workforce, as you can imagine. But you know, part of, of building a, a, a vibrant, functioning economy is making sure that we have the vibrancy and the connectivity in our public transit system. And so that's why we think it's important. Thank you. You know, I, I think it's, it's to the benefit of the entire Commonwealth, these efforts, right? Everything that we do, um, and obviously we try, to, we try to make sure that we're accounting for, for equities, but, you know, we are a Commonwealth, and that is my message here today as well. This whole budget is about driving down uh, costs, you know, affordability, competitiveness, equity, and really meeting the moment as a, as a Commonwealth, as a state. And if we work together, um, work with one another, support one another, I think all of us, all of us will thrive. Thank you so much.